My, my background is uh, business administration. So uh, I, I have my, I did my studies in that. I was marketing director of a Japanese company in Austria and product manager before I founded my own company. And it's, it's called information design. So it's something like uh, in the UK, it's the Sign Design Society, or it's the SEGD in uh, the United States. And uh, we, we deal with any kind of how to move information so that it's beneficial so for someone else. How can we enable people to achieve their goals? So, in fact, it's nothing else. You are not familiar with, with a topic or with a space. And uh, how quick we can manage that uh, you can orientate, you can navigate, you can use this property or this topic or whatever it might be. And of course, there are two different ways. Uh, the first is uh, you assume that everyone is stupid and you say, go right, now turn left, now go right, stop, and that's it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the wayfinding for, for, uh, for sheep. And the other one is how can we and how quick can we give you an understanding of a topic or of a space so that you can uh, move and handle it autonomously. So this is a kind of uh, strategy, political um, approach, however you call it. And, um, but basically how quick and for us, uh, it's, it's the mantra, how quick we can educate someone to use something new. This, this is more or less uh, the topic. And um, in information design, it's just about enabling people. And the, the disciplines we make use of could be cognitive science, could be uh, psychology, could be sociology, anthropology. Um, it could be, of course, graphic design, but also sound design and whatever is needed. Um, to make this educational process going on. So th this is uh, the basic introduction. And um, ten years, <laughs> ten years ago, I had the pleasure to meet uh, Tim Fendley. And I don't know whether you are familiar with Tim Fendley from uh, Applied, but he is the one who has invented the legible city concept, uh, which you can see uh, all these signs navigating in London, but also in Bristol now and some other uh, cities where you uh, get a map for an understanding and not only directions. And uh, the map, which is common for UK and common for Japan, but it's a <gasps> absolute new phenomenon in the middle of Europe that the maps are face up and not north up. Because, of course, a classic German would say, how stupid you can be not to be able to read a map and turn for yourself in your mind. But when it's foggy and you are in a foreign city, then you are quite happy that you know what's on the top is in front of me, right is right and left is left. So this is our approach to wayfinding. and. Um, we had been in a lucky situation to implement uh, the first signs in, um, in Vienna to apply this legible city concept also for Vienna. This was a starting point. And uh, by this, we, we had been recommended um, for a project which is uh, Schönbrunn Garden. It's not the palace, but it's the garden or the park. And uh, how can people be assisted in navigating and find their way in Schönbrunn Garden. So this leads me to my first question. Who of you have been already in Schönbrunn Gardens? Babak, someone else? No. Okay, so I will, I will give you a, a, a short introduction on the garden so that you know what we, what we see if we are outside and you might see and then lead slowly to the topic of way losing. And it's, it's very nice that uh, Mel uh, is advocate of all those who enjoy uh, losing their ways and being professional in that. 
and um, and not all the others who say, oh, I always know my friends. So it's it's a good mix and a nice balance. And um, Schönbrunn Gardens. Uh, before we do any project on on uh, way showing or way finding. We always uh, start, of course, with research, and um, basically we, we send out uh, very nice people. And uh, in the minimum, we talk to about 200, 300 people, something like this, how they behave, how they feel, how they use, and how they enjoy um, a specific place. And um, Schönbrunn, uh, this is one of these classic impressions. Uh, you, you see the, the palace, and uh, also you see in this picture, 70% uh, of the picture is green, which means we have a lot of nature um, in the back of this uh, palace. And um, the, the interesting thing about this uh, space is that uh, on the one hand, you have uh, around 5 million tourists, uh, which is a lot, but Versailles has 8 million tourists. So it's only 5 million tourists uh, in a year before COVID-19. But at the same time, you have uh, more than 200 people living in the palace or in the buildings around. And uh, you have also um, uh, 50 offices in this area. Uh, you have a big zoo, one, the biggest one of Austria, of course, and the most famous one. Uh, you have um, a school for uh, gardening. And of course, uh, Schönbrunn is not only a hotspot for tourists, but it's a place for the locals. So there are several apps about jogging uh, in this garden and uh, there is a public swimming pool and whatever it might be so it's not only a place for tourists it's also a place for the locals and it's also a place for residents and it's also a place for people working there and uh, when we go further to the topic of uh, wayfinding or way losing then we also have to say it makes a big difference whether you visit this place um, as an individual or with your family, or if you are part of a group. As a cliche or a classic example, it's uh, the Chinese or a Japanese uh, busload of uh, a group of 40, 50, and sometimes even more people. So it's all about handling this kind of um, mix of people. Um, whenever you have any question in between, you just let me know and uh, please don't hesitate uh, to go for it. Um, the interesting thing is, and now you see the map, that uh, the basic picture you know is just the front of the palace. And 90% uh, of all tourists are not aware of this huge garden in the back. And uh, you, you see here the map of uh, the whole um, area. Uh, the brown part is, is the zoo. Um, the dark green is, is really a forest with white foxes and uh, other animals. And, um, and you see in this light green, this is this Baroque garden. And um, you see that the yellow buildings is quite a small part of uh, this entire area. It's, it's a public space, which means uh, everyone can enter without paying and also without being checked and uh, other things. There is a kind of uh, portier on the doors, but basically it's, it's, a, it's a public uh, space. And um, when we have a closer look on, um, the, um, on the map, then um, you can see that in this design of a Baroque garden, and this is just now a, 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 a subset of it, uh, you know there is a huge potential of losing your way. Because more or less the flowers look different, but the trees look all the same, and the crossroads look all the same, and even uh, the fountains, are, if you are not looking too carefully, almost the same. So it's very, very probably and very easy possible that you get lost over there. 
Um, and this is one of the, the impression and, and the, the, the landscape which you can see. And, and it, also the distances are enormous because uh, people uh, have no idea how big the buildings are. So that's a reason for this, that they uh, think it, they are much, much closer than they assume. And so it just takes a long, long time to get over there. Um, our um, client uh, is, of course, uh, the company running uh, the castle, the palace. And for them, one of the most important thing is uh, time management. Because it's, I think, similar with a lot of uh, famous uh, touristic hotspots. If you buy a ticket, it doesn't mean automatically that you can enter the palace immediately. Uh, but in, in, I would say, in 10 months out of 12, you get a time slot. And in this time slot, which you shouldn't miss, because otherwise no chance to see Sissy and um, her darling, um, then um, you have to be there in front of the door and getting in in your slot. Uh, but uh, if you are one of the classic tourists, then it's not only about the palace, uh, it's also about uh, finding the toilet in time. It's about having the famous Sacher chocolate cake with a cup of coffee. It's about getting the souvenirs. It's about making the fantastic picture you have seen in the books and uh, at Instagram. It's not missing your slot and it's not losing your group and it's getting back to your bus in time again. So out of this, uh, there is a big, big pressure on people. On the other hand, if you have uh, your ticket in hand and uh, your time slot is in about one hour, of course, the company running or the authorities running this space, they have a huge interest that you make maximum use of time, which means that uh, you can calculate that uh, you have your cup of coffee, you get your souvenirs, and uh, you pay for the toilet and uh, get your photo and maybe even visit another space before you go back and come back and uh, visit your grand tour of the palace. So um, that's the intention. From that point is, of course, uh, we give orientation, we give an overview, we give a calculation of time and of walking. Um, to make maximum benefit of each visitor. And um, if we talk to um, the people uh, spending the time outside there, then uh, of course you come to a different uh, approach and a different attitude. And that uh, way losing is a topic. Uh, we, we got a lot of answers like uh, this nice lady from the United States and she said, we were looking for the Roman ruins and we ended up in a swimming pool. So uh, the direction system and the navigation system um, was not that good. Otherwise, um, you might have found uh, the Roman ruins, but it's this uh, part of discovery. And uh, also in our, uh, in our research, we found many, many people who say, we visit the garden during our stay a second, a third, a fourth time, just because we love this atmosphere. And uh, I think it was, who, who was it of you who said, uh, I think it was Anne, um, this, uh, this garden, unexpected space in, in a two million uh, people city, that it's so close and uh, nevertheless it's it's not like the Central Garden or Hyde Park, but it's unexpected huge. And it's unexpected a uh, quite wild area um, in, um, in the sense of nature. So um, here we are. And then we uh, met, of course, a lot of 
people who said uh, we love to get lost and uh, being outside business, outside the uh, hustle bustle of your city trip and uh, just enjoy uh, unlimited rich nature with uh, most beautiful flowers and arrangements. And um, this uh, leads us to a very uh, crazy metaphor, but I think you all are familiar with that. It's, it's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And I must confess, I never understood anything out of physics. Uh, but um, people say that in, in this Heisenberg uncertainty principle, um, and not to mix up with uh, Breaking Bad Heisenberg, um, it's, uh, it's about the position and the momentum. So if we have a very clear understanding of the position, on the other hand, we lose the momentum. And on the other side, if we have a very clear understanding of the momentum, we have no idea of the position. Um, don't ask me more details about this, but it's about the waves and uh, the precision of uh, location of um, an element area. And um, this could be quite good working also for uh, the way of how we um, behave and how we find our way and how we experience um, a foreign unknown space. Um, and in, in the most radical approach that uh, if you always follow your navigational system in your car or the app on your phone, then uh, you are there but uh, you missed the way. You have no idea where you are, but you are there. And um, which means you know your position, but you have no idea about the momentum. And the momentum I would um, translate as the context of uh, where you really are. So you know where you are, uh, but you don't know what it is, how it is, uh, and above that you have no idea about um, the way coming there. And uh, on the other hand, if if you are lost in your emotions, dreams, thoughts, or just vibes and feelings that that you say, and coming home you say, ah, oh, it was so fantastic over there. You know, people nice, and the food was excellent. And then you ask your company and say, what was the what was the name of the place? And uh, you have no idea where exactly it was. And it's nice um, that uh, I just uh, stopped my screen over there because to see uh, Rika and, uh, and Yanis, I think in, in Greek language you have two expressions of time. And the one is time as a daytime, and I think it was Kronos. And you have another expression for time where it's just this... Uh, unlimited uh, period of time. Is this true or is this a misconception of my Greek language? It's time, chronos, yes, chronos is time, but uh, this vast thing that you're talking about, I'm trying to remember if there is really a word of this. Um, Could be. I'll yeah. think about it and I'll come back to you okay. in, in a minute. Just, just think. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But, but maybe not only in Greek, but in, in many other languages, we, we have these uh, mm. two different ways how to um, approach or regard time. The one as the exact position and the other one as, as the momentum of time. Yes. Then really quick and, and just say maybe for our purposes, the unconscious would do. <laughs> yeah, something like this, yes. <laughs> the conscious and the unconscious, yeah. Um, so, um, and for us in, in, in wayfinding, uh, we, we could say, yes, on the one hand, we just have to lead someone getting there and coming uh, safely back again. But uh, in offering a space, we would like to offer both possibilities 
on the one hand, not to get lost because uh, it's a tragedy if you are not in time back for your bus or you miss your plane or you are late for dinner or whatever it might be. But on the other hand, our assisting tools or our, our intervention in the garden should also allow you or even motivate you to get into this unconscious mood in this losing um, of uh, place and time just to enjoy more uh, the environment and the place where you are. So it might be again about time management because uh, if you have any time of the world it's easy to uh, to get lost because somehow you can afford getting lost but on the other hand uh, if you can't afford because you are part of a group you are part of a schedule uh, then of course it's always necessary uh, that uh, you have always a right feeling of um, position position in location but also position in time and uh, for this, uh, maybe, and now we are already in, 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 in uh, hopefully in discussion and in, in, your, um, in your opinions and your attitudes and, and your expertise on that. It's not about the time management of the garden, but how can we go into a kind of time management that uh, we have, if possible, a control of position or momentum and uh, can we allow us to get lost for a certain period of time and how to get back into position again and how can we as someone who is not only directing but also as our ambition is that you enjoy the place uh, as much as possible how can we trigger a kind of way losing which means um, the journey is the reward without being in the palace or without being at the Gloriette or all these uh, must do five things you have to do when you visit Schönbrunn Garden. And um, for this it's, it's just uh, the question between position and momentum and um, how we can assist for this. And um, yeah, with, with that I, I would like to end uh, and finish my, my little um, introduction on that and um, looking forward uh, to your uh, reflection, inputs, uh, opinions or experiences you had at any other places. Thank you for your attention. Um, that's great, uh, fantastic, well done Martin. Oh, I just had a question about um, the close-up of uh, the map of the park. I noticed in a very, um, you know, it's a very rigid um, paths and so forth. But I did notice one uh, path was called the Ear Garden Alley, which I think Barton could translate as uh, roughly like what we're talking about here. Um, making an error on your way path, but it seemed to be set in a very rigid Wait, place, or a very, a place where you really wouldn't be able to do it. So I'm wondering what the reference in that particular part of the park, Ear Garden Alley, okay, what's the, Ear Garden about their spot? Uh, the the Diagat is a very nice place for uh, for all children and uh, for also for the adults. It's a maze, and uh, if you pay extra, you get uh, double lost. Uh, so you pay that you just enter the maze and enjoy not getting out in time or whatever might be. There's a nice snack. It's it's one of the attraction in the garden itself, and so it's a it's a maze in the maze, something like that. Yeah. So it's like a traditional one, like you've uh, had exactly. this diagram at this. Yeah, I, I didn't notice that it looked. Um, you couldn't tell 
or I didn't see it in the depiction there. So, yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah, and uh, at, at, at the same time, thank you uh, very much for Kairos and Kronos. This, this was the thing I meant, and thanks for putting it in the chat. Uh, I think it was Yanis or whoever. Um, thanks for this. I, I missed this second word for the past five years, and happy to have it back again. Yeah, thanks a lot for this. Yeah, yes, please. I, I'd like to ask you a question. It, I mean, it seems to me that the park is predominantly for tourists. Am I right in thinking that? Uh, for the income, yes. Um, the past uh, five months, now it's back again to the locals. Ah, um, because I was, I was wondering, you know, you talked a lot about people coming in and being on the coach and having a, an itinerary and yes. time, which to me seems very counterproductive if you want to enter into a space which is timeless. That's the word I was thinking about when you were talking about time. Yeah. It's a very nice way and a, often a word we use in meditation, something, you know, is, is beyond time. And I'm just wondering about how you, um, how you can, how you market this, this place for the locals to come and just be and to get away from the city. And um, what's, your, what's your feeling on that? You know, sort of the difference between a tourist coming where they're on a time, you know, uh, they've got two hours, three hours, and someone who lives in the city who can maybe visit very often, you know, um, and I'd, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Um, th thanks for asking. The, on the one hand, the locals know what they have because it's, it's a tradition in every family to go to the zoo. And on the way to the zoo, you conquer uh, the, the gardens. So it's, it's part of your home feeling. It, it's not something which is external because you, you don't have to pay to, to enter the garden. Uh, you can do your jogging, you visit the public uh, swimming pool, uh, you enjoy the nature and the view, and um, it's a nice Sunday afternoon. And there are also a lot of uh, uh, restaurants and cafes where you uh, can um, spend your uh, afternoons or Sundays in, in a very, very nice way. Uh, the, on the other hand, um, if you, may, may I share my, my screen again, please? And I, I will go back to the map. I'm sorry, this now takes a little bit. I think it's not that many. Mr. Heisenberg, Breaking Bad, and here we are. Um, you, you now see the, the entire map. And uh, people start as a tourist, you start on, on the bottom, entering this uh, big yard, this Ehrenhof court, sorry, court, and being in front of, of the castle. And then you see on top between the two little lakes, there's this Gloriette. So um, people come in, walk around uh, the, the main building, see the garden, but then the tourists are quite hesitating to go too far because not to be lost or being back um, later than expected. So basically, uh, one of the challenges is how can we motivate uh, the tourists or the, let's, let's call them the foreigners who are not familiar with the space to go for their own discovery? How can we trigger them uh, to be brave and uh, go into the jungle. And um, on the other hand, but assure that if they need help, our system is there at once. It, it's like the, the fire extinguisher. Um, if you don't need them, hopefully you can't see them. But in case of emergency and you need them, it should be oh, in the first second visible for you. And this is something we, we would like to, to implement um, within this project that, of course, 
the whole stage should be given to the nature and to the architecture and uh, to the whole arrangement and the Baroque garden. But in case of emergency, because it's running late or it's getting dark or you have your slot, that immediately uh, this um, assisting system is visible for you, understandable for you, and um, you go immediately into the right direction. This, this, this is more or less the, the, the challenge what we have. So the locals, they know the place, they, they behave like home. Uh, for them, we, we could start uh, telling a little bit more. There's a fantastic Japanese garden but I think most of the locals don't know it. Um, there is um, a very nice, very beautiful, very little fountain, which is called the Beautiful Fountain, which gives the name to the entire space. But I think 99% of the Viennese people don't know where this little fountain is located. So, of course, uh, our ambition would be to make these unknown things getting familiar and knowing it and looking for this little fountain, which is very hidden. Uh, but on the other hand, also uh, to, to invite the tourists to behave a little bit like the locals and just enjoy the nature. Also, you have your Baroque rooms and the story of Sissi and <gasps> all the other things which are written in, um, I would say, the, the classic guidebooks uh, you get. I don't know whether this was an answer to Mel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, th that's, that's the fantastic thing about uh, this place, that it offers so many opportunities. And I must say, um, thanks to, to the people we had been talking to, we learned again this importance of getting lost. But this is the first part of the story. The second part of the story is how to react on this. It also in, in, in this uh, contract with our client who says, it's about time management. People should have their coffee, their souvenir, additional ticket for the maze, and being happy if they're back um, in the bus. So this is, this is the thing we, we are working on. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Bob has um, written uh, a challenging question in the uh, in the uh, chat. So, Martin, can you can you can everyone read that question? Because of course, Bob is struck dumb by technology. Um, but if you can't, he says in relation to transfinite calculal, the Russian movement, the name of God is God spawned a breakthrough in twentieth century maths by naming the unnameable. Similarly, by naming infinity, it became graspable. There seems to be a similarity with this process you're presenting. So it's all about vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> you come up with a timeless management, and uh, you've got your you made. Uh, what, what would be the answers of the others on this? <laughs> well, I can take uh, a little stab, stab at this, actually, uh, I think. Um, but of course, I'll be paraphrasing and interpreting what uh, Bob is referring to. Um, the good thing is that uh, if he disagrees, then it will take a while before he can react to uh, my wrong <laughs> interpretation, because he has to type in uh, his response. And by that time, we might already be on another subject. So if I talk fast enough, I might be able to get away with it. Um, but um, what I think the impl implication of what Bob is saying is that by addressing the process of potentially getting lost by naming this process, you make people more familiar with it. So they recognize what it is and then can deal with it. Uh, as opposed to uh, when you literally get lost in a forest, uh, that's very stressful if you uh, really have no clue out, uh, on how to get out. But, but by contextualizing it and identifying it as such, you make it graspable and something that people can deal with. I think that's what the context of that question is. And I think indeed that, uh, Martin, this is sort of like what you are uh, referring to, but that's just my interpretation of what you're explaining. 
I was just going to say I'm I'm from a literary point of view, uh, having you know literature, comparative literature is my my studies, and it just it just made me think immediately of of uh, the unnameable. I don't know how many Beckett fans are here today, but uh, in his novel, quite lengthy novel, The Unnameable, La Nomable, you know, it's never, you never get to know this character, and yet there's so much, you know, there's, it's just this long, long, long text of, of speaking and speaking, but you don't, you, you don't get to know the character. Uh, unless you know the characters through the other characters, so that it's kind of a reflection, and it takes on whatever uh, characteristics you you want to to have reflected back. So there's something of that. I don't know if I'm maybe making it a little bit uh, more complex than it needs to be um, by adding that that you know, element to it, um, the idea of reflection. But, uh, yeah, I'm very interested in all of this with the notion of, of being able to, the dialectic of position and momentum from physics. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely way to approach many fields and many concepts. So I look forward to hearing what others have to say. Uh, Helen, are you making a comment on this, uh, or is this a separate question? Yeah, I've, I've got a question. I have yeah. a question. Okay. Um, it's it's really it's more of an observation in a way, which is, um, I think your clients, Martin, and perhaps you by reflection, have to consider the nature of the people visiting place, which. Um, I remember a, a piece of work that my company did 20 years ago. We found it was to do with moving around a space and what you saw and what you found. It much, much more limited than, than the park. But we discovered quite quickly that there were people who wanted to know about where they were and what, the, what was happening and other people who simply wanted to experience. And I think, I feel like your clients have to get their head around the fact that there are these different kinds of people. If I was a tourist coming to Vienna and wanted to explore the park, I would be extremely irritated, really, by the fact that there were these five things that I, you know, was expected to want to do. And I had to fit them all in. And actually, I would be much more interested in experiencing one fir tree than than all the rest of it, really. I think the depth of experience is what some people are after. Some people are after tick boxes and want to tick off right. things. And I know your clients want Many. also, because they're reliant on the income, they want people to have a bit of everything. But for some people, that's not really what they want. Um, and I just wonder about your conversations with your clients about you know, whether this is coming up. Well, uh, of, of course, in, in, in the business relation, you, you can't talk about something uh, where you propose to lose money. Um, no. This is not a good idea. Um, but on, on the other hand, of course, uh, there, there's a very nice side effect. If you... Uh, if you have a tendency to the momentum, then uh, you would come back a second time. Yeah. And uh, this, this is, of course, uh, already almost a loyal customer. And uh, because if the client, I'm, I'm very sorry to, to talk so much business now, but you, you know, it's, it's always about calculation because the way, the, the nice thing about information design is you always can calculate um, the benefit of it. And also with this, if we can really motivate, um, and I'm, I apologize for this boring aspect of uh, enjoying nature, but if we can motivate visitors to come back a second or third time, 
then of course they spent again a little bit of money over there because at least they go for a cup of coffee. So it's not too bad also to offer this second aspect of not tick boxing, but of coming back, enjoying the area again and not going to any other museum or any other place. So um, on the other hand, of course, uh, we, 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 we want to have a satisfied visitor. And uh, for this, how to invite this or how to express this invitation of uh, staying here longer than planned. Uh, I, know, I know Ben's got a question to ask or uh, chip in. Uh, observation, Ben, do you want to? Yes, this is from the perspective of um, being a, a tour guide and working with tour guides and turning people into tour guides. I, I've discovered that when people arrive at a place for the first time, especially a huge place like Schoenbrunn, that uh, they want it to take over, you know, that it's a lot to take on, it's a lot of choices to make, and perhaps one reason they've arrived is to surrender decision-making, choice-making. And um, if you had the... I, I was trying to figure out how this would work, but I, I haven't really solved it. But a, a roving tour guide who could meet at will people, almost like um, a shopper. Sometimes if you if you go clothes shopping, someone will start pestering you to uh, uh, try to, you know, ask if you need any help, if you need any advice, if there was somebody on the grounds suggesting that you might like to spend time uh, discovering the various um, hidden sides of the, uh, the the grounds. That might be one way to get them there. But also, those people absolutely will not remember the way <laughs> that if you if you took them if you took them to the you know if, if you had the free tour guide appear by chance and offer the secret routes to the Japanese garden that some people would take them up on their offer, especially if you told them how long it might take to get there, whether that was 10 minutes or uh, or, or more. And then once you arrived and showed them around the um, uh, Japanese garden, they would have no memory, especially if it wasn't an obvious route that you took to get there, of how to get back. So you then have the optional, um, you know, how, how, how thrilled are you about being lost? because you are now lost. And then, then people are, uh, have the option of trying to discover their own way back. And I, you know, I imagine that they wouldn't be so lost that they couldn't do that within uh, 20 or 30 minutes, or perhaps perhaps it's yeah. longer than that. But there it is, uh, you know, a way of introducing the unexpected option. Nobody will arrive thinking, I hope I ha am offered the option to somehow get lost. And most people m perhaps wouldn't want that <laughs> you know many people wouldn't want um, to be uh, disorientated in that way but at least that there was the option of some you know a small fraction of your visitors um, um, that, that's very interesting because uh, in in many concepts of um, exhibition design and at museums uh, there is a tendency that in the first space uh, they try to make you lost. In, in, in many cases, you enter a black, dark space uh, just to maybe to get down to zero or to to delete your uh, expectations, your hard disk, and be open for the new one. Um, this, this would be your your invitation to the Japanese garden or something like that, and it would be interesting. Can we scale this up on a public space, like outside space, not only the first room of an exhibition, but also in entering Versailles or entering the Tour Eiffel or um, whatever it might be? Could we have a kind of a clearing stage before to forget about the bus and being in a mental mood open for the unexpected. That would be nice. Um, how to... It would be cheap and cheap and easy. And I, I, I imagine that you have um, a, a team of volunteers working 
uh, or maybe I'm wrong, but a lot of uh, large museums and so on have a, a, a you know a large voluntary um, force who could do that with it, <laughs> you know, enjoy doing it. Just yeah. they'd know the way, and that's all they would have to do: some polite chit chat on the way, and then yeah. abandon them, or not abandon them. Yeah. That'd be fun. I'd enjoy, I'd like that job. <laughs> I'd do that every Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> What's your profession? <laughs> I am oh, a tour guide. <laughs> I did my MA in. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else have some questions? I know Babak wants to ask another question and Bob, but um, and uh, Jeremy want to chip in. Not a question or a comment or a, what you've heard so far. Martin, when you said the dark room. Uh, as a disorientating uh, 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 boy, uh, maybe Sharon Bruin, meaning beautiful fountain, maybe you could have some kind of uh, water, uh, people being doused with water <laughs> when they come in. Yeah. A beautiful spurt of water just knocking them <laughs> upside the head. The, Refresh for a, a new experience. Okay, uh, I only can um, propose you to go to Salzburg, and uh, the castle is called Hellbrunn, and this is the best place to get wet uh, and have this experience. You get in, you have no idea where the water comes from, but it will come, and this is the big fun. Ah. This Hellbrunn castle. Yes, it's a little bit smaller, so easier to handle. And um, fortunately, people know what it will happen, so they are they they are quite easygoing with that. Yes, but um, um, water is, is is one of of the the uh, basic element of a baroque garden because it's the mirroring of uh, the sky, and uh, so it was always. Uh, as you also know from Versailles and many other Baroque places, the water is one of the main elements. So it would be a, a, a very nice uh, procedure and a very nice element to go for this in summertime. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, can you read uh, Bob's question? Can you see Just Bob's chat? Just a second. He's written, is it somewhere between uh, the polarities of destabilization and mystification? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, I just would say it's just about uh, pleasure. D duty and pleasure, maybe something like that, or fulfill my own expectations and uh, but maybe the the uh, Rika could could uh, lead us a little bit in this Kronos and Kairos uh, because we we can we, we maybe it's just this um, feeling of time. How, how can we switch these two emotions or consciousness unconsciousness to make the moment. Huge, immense. Uh, within getting lost, it's uh, obvious that there's a switch of perception in time when you are lost, and everything becomes slower or or um, um, uh, longer. Uh, I would love to get lost uh, in nature and in this park, of course. And uh, I think that the subject, uh, and also I would love to have a second uh, round of this uh, 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 cafe talks with uh, this way losing, because I think it's a huge subject. It, it, it uh, can have uh, other aspects also, like uh, time, what you said, it cannot be talked in just a few seconds, the perception of time uh, in a place like this, and uh, in uh, in the wildness, also <laughs> getting lost in the wildness, <laughs> which I would really love to do. I just wanted also to say about Keros and uh, 
chronos. It's it's you can use it in many forms. It has a vast meaning. Kero, so eonas also. You can say it took eonas to do something. It's um, I I see that you have a certain. Uh, <laughs> um, how can I say you are all a bit obsessed with these words? Why? What? Well, something to do with Heisenberg and the perception of being somewhere and time? Uh, the, the most important thing, of course, is always the context where you are, in which you are. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and context might mean uh, what's your mood. Uh, visiting a place. Are you in love or are you stressed or are you uh, curious about what's uh, going on at home? So all these elements uh, have of course an impact how you perceive uh, a foreign place. And of course we, we as as a as a being in in, in hospitality or to offer, as the Japanese say, this uh, omodenashi. Uh, we, we always want to have uh, happy guests and leaving with good impressions and whatever is is uh, is necessary to come back again and have nice memories about your weekend trip or your your summer holidays. And uh, in, in in wayfinding or with, with our instruments, we, we are the very first and very close communication points. The first thing of a foreign city are the traffic signs. The first thing of uh, a foreign country is the signage at the airport. It's the first touch point of communication. And for this, our our uh, duty is not only lead to the toilet, it's not only make understand the ticket fare system, it's not only to uh, understand how long does it takes to get lost in the maze or not, but it's the first point of communication between the place, the city and the population or the local people with the visitor and the guest. So how can we make this communication point as charming as possible? That's, I think that's, that's the, the, this, this uh, potential of signage. It's like the, the, the red double-decker of, of London. Uh, this means of transport is representing Britain. London. Huh? This is one of the memories. Or as you remember the, the, the uh, ticket for the Paris Metro, this yellow ticket with the brown stripe in the middle. <gasps> if you have this in your hands, then the whole two weeks of your Paris uh, stay comes back to you. And now we have the apps and we are everywhere in Instagram and whatever it might be. And again, we have a local expression of communication. And what's the capacity and what's the opportunity and potential of these communication points? That's that what we are so obsessed about. Is it just to say 10 meters uh, to the toilet or is it 10 meters to your heaven of a holiday experience? This makes us crazy day and night. Yeah. I was I specialize in phenomenology, so there is the sensorial oh. um, and being led by the sensorial, um, not necessarily following routes or guidelines, but actually following your senses and allowing your senses to um, guide you. Um, that's the work that I do as a phenomenologist. Uh, also, in terms of talking about time, um, time is also memory. Um, and memories can play a very powerful role in how we step into a, a space or a place, however you choose to define those. Um, if you think about Paul Ricoeur's um, 
writings on time as the art of forgetting. How, how do we remember, but also how do we, uh, uh, memory can be about many things. So time, if we think about the Annalise School of Time as time of a series of events from the work of uh, Ferdinand Brodel, sort of looking forward, but also time in terms of, of memories and memory making um, as well. And I suppose my interest is in how the sensorial and that notion of time can um, coalesce together. Only can say yes, please. <laughs> how, however, yeah, uh, the um, in, in you, you know the, the the bad jokes of information designers uh, are that if if the architect works well, it doesn't need us. So if 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 the landscape, if the environment, if the surrounding is talking to you properly, you don't need a single sign because you just follow your, how you say, your mood or your vibe or your instinct. Uh, you go as you go and you will come there. And, but sometimes not. Um, not, not in mm. the Baroque garden. They had a different concept on that. Huh? Yeah. And, and of but course, I wonder sometimes, Go ahead, sorry. Please. please now, I please. just wonder from your, your questions on heritage, because I do um, lecture a lot on, on heritage, what is heritage and the paradigms of heritage and how we engage with, with sites through the, through the notion of heritage, that um, there could be perhaps a sensorial way of your visitors um, experiencing the place perhaps by the planting of particular aromatic flowers or plants that actually you consciously or unconsciously follow a kind of fragrance through yeah. the space or the idea of a soundscape and particular sounds that consciously or unconsciously can lead you into certain certain ways that can be way finding and also way way losing at the same time there's a, some really sort of tactile sensory ways you can do that yeah I was lost in roses, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, um, sorry, go sorry. on, Mark. Um, just because we uh, had been talking about the heritage, um, we, we, we have to um, be conscious or we have to remember that Schönbrunn was a private garden. It was never meant for the public. It was to impress the other emperors uh, and please whoever who was, but it was not meant for normal people to walk in and enjoy the Sunday afternoon. So um, um, it, it would be interesting if, if uh, on, on, on larger scale you now go for new cities as, as they're doing in, 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 in the um, Arabic um, region or somewhere else. How can we design public gardens again out from this uh, point of view as Frey mentioned? That would be interesting. Yeah? And uh, which leads to the other discussion uh, about our senses, uh, because uh, it's on, not only about our five senses, but uh, I don't know Frey, how, how many senses uh, you count at the moment, eight, nine, ten? How, what's the number nowadays? Yeah, <laughs> There's a multitude. Your body has an infinite amount, you know, amount of sensorial possibilities. So I tend to talk about more about the corporeality and everything that our okay. body um, brings brings with us. So yeah. Okay. Uh, the, one thing about the idea of chronos in Greek, just to not to, it's good. The, that the, one of the first gods that was Kronos, Kronos is the name for Kronos, who was eating his uh, children, among them Jews. So the first god of the Greek mythology was uh, Kronos, time. And uh, if we can remember uh, Efran, uh, Goya's uh, painting with Kronos eating his children, which is in Prado, where he has that image in a very strong way. So Chronos is eating uh, its own uh, entity, so to say, and uh, it's eating what is there. It's eating what he produces. And 
And uh, only if uh, there is a miracle, like uh, the miracle with uh, someone who saved the Jews and some other gods, uh, and of his children, and they survived, so to say, from their father who wanted to eat them. So in a way, in order for life to get extended, one needs to to denounce uh, their own uh, uh, ancestor, which is uh, Chronos. So that's a very a small comment on this idea of Chronos. So Chronos is very primordial and very strong in the sense we uh, understand it in Greek uh, language and the literature. And the other thing that I wanted to make a comment with uh, what we saw today is uh, for us that we are in the field and uh, of watching practices and all of that, you know, the, the idea of going to a specific place where everything is so controlled with signs, with times, with uh, where you have to go, how long can you stay, it's a re really very challenging in a way because it's totally opposite from what we are doing in most cases out in the field where uh, what Faye has said, the senses and uh, how you react to what is unknown is uh, very crucial to understanding a place. So it's uh, it was very interesting for me to see this to see that as a totally contrasting <laughs> way of experiencing a very uh, controlled landscape because this garden is a very controlled landscape. Uh, I have not visited it, but I can I have seen similar ones, and uh, the way the kings were making. There is uh, another one in Athens much smaller than the size of it. That was also the private garden of the first king of Greece, who was uh, from Bavaria. And uh, there too, you have the sense that you are you are there, but at the same time, you are controlled about what you can do, where you can do, what you have to feel. So from all the, your descriptions, Martin, I really, it's very interesting to see for me the, the experience of uh, Elaborating on that contrast gave me things to consider and think, so to say. Yeah. It's uh, j just a, a, a short uh, comment on this. Uh, Asian people won't go to an uncontrolled space. Uh, for them, it's, it's the maximum of comfort to be in a controlled space. So just to come home in a safe way, and uh, as they regard Europe, especially Japanese, I mean, for, for them, we are aliens. It's it's not that uh, they go in, in the content of continent of wilderness, the way we behave, the way we, we uh, cheat, uh, the way we, uh, find our price system, um, it's, it's, it's really a, a space of wilderness. And of course, when they come in a controlled space, they love it. They feel safe and uh, it's a place they, um, they will come back again. That's the, um, yeah. So, so it's a very cultural uh, perception and, and um, and of course, we, we have we have so many different cultures as visitors and the locals. In addition, um, so, some somehow we have to find maybe like like this uh, uh, many ways of sensorium. We also have to um, develop something like this as a tourist hotspot. How to how to meet all these different cultures in a proper way. And of course, welcome them, not only meet, but welcome them. Martin, uh, have you got uh, one or a few practical examples of how you use information design to facilitate visitors to the park in um, getting lost? Well, uh, the, the very easy thing is that we uh, reduce the number of signs by 50 percent. So uh, we at the moment, you have uh, more than 200 uh, signage uh, posts, and uh, we would like to 
uh, increase the density of information on fewer places so that uh, there are more places without any intervention or science. This is one of the approaches or examples on it. So, uh, how, you, how you say, uh, reduce the pollution, yes. Yeah, or lower information density. Have you got another example? No, higher. The information density has to get higher, but the points of interaction getting fewer. Okay, That's so the... where you provide information, you provide more information? Yes. Once you are on a point of information, then it's not only one direction. For instance, there's, you know, there's this uh, panorama bus uh, circulating around uh, the whole area and they have their own signs. And now we make a multi-use of these pylons, not only as a bus station, but also to inform people about the buildings or uh, the nature mm -hmm. or some telling some stories. So, um, right. so just to lower distraction. Right. So you're, but you're making the information more efficiently available. Yeah. Okay. The the other thing, and I I must say we are so proud of it. Uh, we we get rid of any advertisements and promotions, and we we are so happy about it because before that every single cafe or photo booth or whatever had additional sign, look at me, buy with me, come to me. And thanks to this uh, authority of uh, national heritage, we, we succeeded that there's no other promotion anymore in the signage system. It's absolutely clean and clear. And uh, I know it's a small step, but uh, for this it was um, a big one, yeah. Yeah, Mel, do you want to chip in with your question? Um, it's really an observation, um, and um, what Faye was talking about, um, the senses, and, um, you know, as a teacher of meditation, and I'm running a course at the moment this week, um, where I'm getting people to experience through all sorts of things, through color, through senses, through a labyrinth, a maze. And one of the things that's come up for me listening to this conversation is we've talked a lot about time and about being in the future or being in the past. And I would like to suggest, Martin, that you try to get people to be in the present rather than um, looking at what's to come or what has gone. So that the experience of being actually is a part of the experience of being in the park. And then that takes away a lot of the responsibility as you, of you as the provider of this space to give people X, Y, or Z because they will create it themselves by being in the present moment. Mm. Thank you, yes. We will try hard, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, there's quite a lot, in, in, there's quite a lot in the chat, um, uh, which is really good. We love these kind of um, uh, conversations, are uh, layers of conversations. Well, it's something that, it, that just kept in my head the whole time during this whole discussion and uh, is I was visiting the England with my mom and we went to a, um, not a castle, I can't remember where it was, it was up the river. And there's a maze there and we went in the maze and I, it was something I had really looked forward to my whole trip because I had never been in a maze and uh, like a hedge maze. And we got to the middle eventually and my mother who has a totally different outlook on the world, she just looked at me and she goes, tell me the way back. And I, said, I just looked at her and I said, well, I, I don't know the way back. I mean, it's a maze. I want to sit here. Like we, we got to the middle and, and kind of accomplished being lost and finding a way. And I was so happy to do that. And she was in a panic that she would never find her way back. And I, I really was like flummoxed. I couldn't, I, 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 
I didn't, of course, I didn't know the way back. I said, well, we just have to walk and find the way back. I don't know the answer because I don't know the maze. And so that, that just always was sitting in my mind during, during today of this experience of um, two, two different ways of like, just wanting to know, I need to know the way back now. And then just me, I'm just like, I, I, and I've been in corn mazes, uh, same where people are in a panic because they want to find their way through the maze. And I just like, let my dog choose and go. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not here to find the way. I'm just here to enjoy being lost and not knowing, you know, it, like lost in sort of a safe way and uh, having no itinerary, which is very hard for a lot of other people. So, and, and I'm just talking about in maze experiences. I, I have never been really totally lost in the wilderness. So, um, and, and, then, and then another experience where, uh, which Andrew was present for, we took a, one of my most memorable walks ever um, to the, we were just walking to the, along the ridge line of a mountain and we we had to make our own way. There were about maybe 10 of us and it was very challenging and we didn't really have a particular route and we really couldn't tell how we had gone until we got to the top to turn around, you know, to go down on a tram. And and then the third, so I, I really appreciate what Mel was saying too about being present in the experience of not necessarily being like being lost or just not having a specific, you don't know the route where you're going. You're just going. So those are my, those are my little, they're not questions or just, just feedback really. It's good. It's good. Well, thank you, Graham. I'm glad you, I'm glad you um, spoke up. That's great. Um, okay. So look, uh, we're, 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 we've probably got about another uh, five or 10 minutes left. Um, so uh, if anyone would like to uh, uh, chip in, as I said, there was a really nice parallel conversation going on uh, about literature. I have to put my hand up and say that um, uh, most of the uh, authors you mentioned, I've never read a single word of what they've written. So uh, I've got plenty of catching up to do. Um, but uh, but I, I don't know, is uh, anyone else like to chip in, um, start something new? Uh, I mean, if I'd like to say, uh, I'm the sort of um, person that as long as I've got a kind of consistent surface uh, on which to tread, I feel fairly confident that I can get lost. Um, because I can not have to worry about where I'm treading because my body and and sort of uh, absorbs how I'm traveling over the surface. Uh, and I don't know whether other people feel the same uh, about how we can sort of get into a state of, I don't know whether you call it flow or being or, or daydreaming um, or way losing, you know, and um, uh, I, uh, and that's the kind of element that I actually find really important is, is as long as my footstep is consistent or the surface on which I tread. But I don't know whether other people feel the same or experience something like that. I, I started to, to address a point in the chat and don't, if anybody wants to look at it, I'll, I have a question for Martin related to that. Is there, um, say, if you're back in the forest area, is there a way, are there gates where you could just say, you know, I'm, I have a feeling of being detached from this kind of formal um, directives of what this park wants me to do. I'm, I've been enjoying myself back in this forest area. Can you slip out the back gate without having to, and like, maintain that feeling that you've of reverie that you've generated for yourself can you slip out a back gate or are you required to return to some main gate um by you know the closing time uh i'm not sure whether i have understood the the question properly and can you help me on that are there is there more than one exit? Can one exit in the back uh, yeah. forest area, for example? Um, 
because it's it's um, it, it's a part of of the Viennese um, neighborhood, and that's the reason why it's um, it, it's not a closed area like uh, many other uh, castle gardens or palace gardens, and uh, so there's there's no one main entry. Uh, there's this uh, fashionable entry from the front, um, the Ehrenhof, but uh, the locals never use those. Uh, if you want to go to the zoo, then you take one of the back uh, on, on the top of the map. If you go to the swimming pool, you take one on the right. So it's um, it, it's a very public space. It, so there are many of exiting. Exactly, yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, just I would like to come back to, to Babak's question about uh, how, how do we contribute to, to this uh, getting lost in time and space. Um, what, what we really avoid is a kind of route. Uh, you know, a route is always like a manifesto. You have to do this and that and first this, second, third, pom pom, and uh, follow this, this route. Uh, we, we, we always try to offer a map without a starting and an ending uh, point. So th this is, I know it's not a lot and also in, 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 um, in the sense of present feeling or like, like Mel mentioned, but it's just one of, of um, let's say, the attitude what we would like to follow is not offering routes, but offering maps, whether it's time-wise or in a geographical right. way. I want to thank you all for joining um, this evening. Uh, I especially want to ask, uh, thank Martin and give him the last word. So, Martin, uh, you have the you have the the mic. Okay. Um, may I forward the last word to any one of you? Could you please give me one word? Uh, representing the past two hours, something which came up to your mind or which uh, summarize it or which, uh, which is a feeling or which was the most prominent or important um, word or noun or adjective, whatever it might be. Just uh, give me one word as a, as a conclusion or as a final farewell. Oh dear, only one word. One um, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> they're all, they're always amazing, amazing. <laughs> oh my! I, I think Thank you. More, more of us had that. <laughs> yeah. I, I cheated. Sorry. What? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Asia. Uh, Rika. The useful part. Uh, labyrinth, labyrinth. Labyrinth, okay, thank you. Mm. I, I, I was thinking something along those lines, uh, the idea of Ariadne and the, the thread, so, but, but more of the agency of the self and a lot of what Faye and, and Esha were talking about. I would say the word for me would be relinquish agency. Okay, okay. too. Relinquished. Thank you. And Robert's Oldman, holding his word up, isn't he? Yes, it, it means <laughs> uncertainty. What is it? Yeah, uncertainty, yeah. I think. Okay, thank you. What about old man, Craig? I'll piggyback on relinquish. I like that. Thank you. What about Mel? Controlling. Controlling, okay. And uh, Yanis? I think he's written it in the chat. Uh, okay. Guidance. Yep. Guidance. Thank you. Uh, Babak? Yeah, for me, uh, I can never um, decouple Vienna from Ultravox. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's an insider, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Faye? Uh, sensory. Sensory, of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, I hope not to have missed anyone. Uh, Andrew? Uh, timeless. Timeless. Okay. Maybe timeless management. 
What about Ben? Has Ben had his word? I, I, I liked um, relinquish, um, so I'm I'm borrowing that theme, but using the word surrender. Surrender. Okay. Fine. So, so my my word is thank you very much uh, for the pleasure and for the enjoyment meeting you. Uh, hope to stay in touch somehow. And um, yes, thank you for the magic evening. Um, thanks a lot for the pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Sean.